In this video, I'm going to be reviewing the new Gen 2 acrylic paints from Humbrol. A quick note, these paints are still in development, so may be subject to change. Hi guys, and welcome back to LPJ Models. During my recent trip to Airfix, I was given several Humbrol Gen 2 acrylics to try. And as I love my paint, I thought I'd do a video. These new paints are supplied in a 14ml dropper bottle, which is a great improvement on the previous tubs Humbrol supplied. The previous range of paint had a bit of a bad reputation with graininess and inconsistency, so I'm really hoping with these paints, Humbrol have addressed those issues. But there is only one way to find out, so let's take a look in depth at these paints. For continuity, I primed my test model with the supplied Humbrol acrylic primer. This was just sprayed on in several light coats to prepare the surface. I'm not usually a fan of rattle cans, but this went down quite smoothly. For the first test, we're going to see how these paints go down with a brush, something that's often overlooked because there still are a great deal of brush painters out there. The first colour I'm using is Humbrol Cockpit Green number 78, straight out of the bottle. I'm also using a soft sable brush like I would in a real world situation. My first impression with this paint is how smoothly it brushed. The paint spread out evenly without any separation or clagginess. The coverage so far is also really promising. Now let's try the same paint thinned with a drop of water. At the time I'm recording this video, the end of July 2022, the thinners for these paints are still in development. So unfortunately, I don't have any in hand for the review. Anyway, the paint is covering evenly and predictably, even with that small amount of thinning. Next color for my brush test is Gunmetal number 53. Both Gunmetal and Silver seem a bit thinner than the other colors, so these will be applied straight out of the bottle. Gunmetal presents with the standard granularity you see in brushed metallic colours, but once this starts to dry, it blends in nicely. And despite being quite a thin paint, the coverage is fairly decent as well. The next colour in my brush paint test was number 26, Khaki. This was again brushed straight out of the bottle. It's a little thinner than the cockpit green, but the covering power is really good. If you take a look at the cockpit green sections, they've self-leveled really nicely. This colour is number 90, beige green or RAF sky. Being a lighter colour, the opacity isn't quite as good, but it's to be expected. It's still performing well for a single coat brush painted test. Okay, so let's take a look at 33 matte black. When initially picking the paint up on my brush, it looked a little transparent for a black. And it also had a kind of stickiness about it. But let's take a look at how this goes down on plastic. I'm not overly impressed with the brush performance of the black. Compared to the other paints, it's going down quite streaky and isn't really that opaque. But I will be passing this information on to Humbrol and hopefully they do something to change this. The white performs as you'd expect for a white. In fact, the coverage is a little better than I'd expected. So let's have a little rundown of the brushing performance of these new Humbrol acrylics. The paints are silky smooth, which is a nice improvement over the old ones. The coverage is pretty good, but I will be doing a more in-depth opacity test later. The paints self-level nicely, which is really important if you're brush painting. And the major downer so far is that matte black. Next up is the airbrush test. And there's a couple of disclaimers before I start this one. First up is a reminder that the thinner for these paints isn't out yet. And secondly, I'm shooting these paints through a 0.15 needle and nozzle. This is ultra fine and most people spray with a 0.2 upwards. So this will likely have some bearing on the results. Because I want to evaluate all of the colors Humbrol provided, 
For the first airbrush test, I'm using Aircraft Blue number 65. I'm also a firm believer that paint thinning ratios and air pressure settings are very personal to the modeler using the paint. But for transparency, I sprayed these paints at around 15 psi and thinned them at around 60% thinner to 40% paint, or thereabouts. And also, the ambient temperature of the room where I was spraying the paints was 21 degrees. The thinner I'm using for these tests is VMS Airbrush Thinner 2.0. It's a reliable thinner and has worked well with all acrylics that I've thrown at it in the past. Anyway, let's actually get spraying. For the first part of the test, I'm going to be spraying some solid colours. Nothing fancy. Contrast-wise, Aircraft Blue isn't showing up well against the Primer Grey. But it is going down smoothly with minimal overspray. The next colour I'm going to test is number 11, Silver. I'm spraying this over the previously brush painted black so you can see it better. This one is also unthinned, straight out of the bottle. If I were to do the test again, I might thin it a little bit, but it's still going down really nicely. Despite the granular look common among metallic paints, the paint is actually really smooth. With its poor brushability, I'm interested to see how the black sprays. To be honest, even though the thinning ratio needs some tweaking, it's actually laying down really nicely, which is a bit of a contrast to how it brushed. And as you can see in this section of the footage, I did slightly over thin the paint. But no big deal, at least we know it sprays reasonably nicely. Now let's try some effects with the airbrush, like black basing and detail painting. I'm starting this test with black basing as it's a technique that I enjoy using. And the colour I'm using is 165 medium sea grey. Because of the temperature of the room, I got a small amount of tip dry, which did hinder the initial flow of the paint. But once the paint was flowing consistently, it was easy to achieve a black based finish. One thing that always concerns me when spraying water based acrylics is that it doesn't often atomise quite as well as a lacquer would, leaving you with that speckled sort of edge to the sprayed area. And while thinning and air pressure ratios definitely have something to do with that, I also firmly believe that the paint plays a factor in this as well. And luckily, tests in this area seemed really positive. Despite the paint being slightly sticky at the start, and I believe that's down to the temperature and the lack of proper thinner, once everything was underway, the results were pretty good. One thing to remember when trying a new paint brand is that you do have to practice with it to get optimal results. When transitioning to different brands, like Mission Models for example, or MRP, I've always had to do a few kits to really get into the swing of learning how to use the paint. So it's not always as simple as open the bottle and spray it and have an amazing finish. There's always a degree of trial and error and practice before you get those results. You might have noticed that as the footage has progressed, I've got a bit more adept with spraying the paint. My spray patterns have got a whole lot tighter and that's just from spending a little bit of time with the paint. With that little black basing test done, it's time to do some camouflage and line work. I started by drawing the outline of the camouflage in cockpit green. I'm using very little needle aperture for control, so this took a small amount of time to build up to opacity. I know the colour is slightly hard to see, but I will be testing other colours shortly. Once the outline was complete, I moved the airbrush away a small amount and filled in the insides. The next colour I used for the detail and line test was number 29, Dark Earth. This should prove to be a bit more visible. There was a little splatter with that first burst, but I think that was down to tip dry. Once I'd made sure my needle was properly clean, the paint sprayed pretty well, 
With a little bit of practice, I reckon I could get some really tight spray work out of these paints. Whoops, there was a little bit of clogging there. With my dark earth tests, there were only a few hiccups. And being optimistic, I'm gonna put these down to my setup. 0.15 is a very finicky size to spray through. And if you have any wild cards, like brown for example, where the pigment is ground slightly coarser, then you are likely to run into some problems. I always have trouble with Second World War German Red Brown. Whatever the brand, if I'm spraying through this setup, I get similar results. So, finally, let's see how we get on with the black. Despite its earlier brushing performance, 33 black has really good fine detail spraying capabilities. The models are tight and controlled and there's minimal overspray. I did however get a little bit of tip dry. And that little spider webby blob there is where you always do your first spray on a bit of paper. So let's do a rundown of the sprayability of these paints. These paints when sprayed have great coverage. And despite the heat, with the thinners I used went down really smoothly. And despite my airbrush setup, I was able to get some black basing and some fine line work out of these paints fairly easily. But being a water-based acrylic, it is prone to tip dry. And our Great British Summer did nothing to help that. My next test will be on the opacity of the paints. How do they hold up to being painted over two contrasting colours? And to keep it fair, each colour gets one coat of paint with as few brush strokes as possible. Let's get stuck in. For this test, I'm going roughly light to dark and we're starting with white. Next up is silver. Followed by beige green. Next up was aircraft blue. Followed by medium sea grey. And then dark sea grey. Followed closely by gunmetal. And then cockpit green. immediately followed by khaki and then dark earth followed finally by black for the most part the colors performed as i'd expected in the opacity test with the light colours and metallics performing better than I'd expected, the darks surprised me because they showed more of the contrast between the grey and the black. But you can always do two coats. This is one of my favourite tests because you can really go to town on the paint and see how it holds up. Let's take a look at the overall durability of these Humbrol acrylics. First up, the tape test. The paint has been dry for around 15 minutes and the tape hasn't been detacked. Let's see if we get any left. All good. I did do it several times just to make sure and all results were the same. Next, I'm going to scratch the paint with my fingernail to see if anything happens. I'm not going easy here because I wanted to put the paint through its paces. And brilliantly, no damage. How about a toothpick? With a reasonable pressure, I'm starting to burnish the paint a little bit. It's only when I really start scrubbing into the paint that I get any damage. That result is excellent. This paint is coping way beyond what you'd expect a regular finish to put up with. Sanding is often a problem with water-based acrylics because they can peel. So again, I put these paints to the test. 
Firstly, with an Infini model 800 grit sanding pad. It wore away some of the areas damaged by the toothpick, but didn't peel any paint off. Now for the real acid test, a nail file. Something I wouldn't expect you to have to do to a paint finish, but let's see how it goes. So that's no paint peel and a lightly feathered edge. That's exactly what you hope for when sanding a paint. Next up is to slather some setting solutions onto the paint to see if it reacts. Starting with Micro Set. This is fairly inert, so it should be fine. What about Micro Sol? I have had trouble with this reacting with Tamiya paints in the past, but luckily there was no drama. Now it's time for Mr. Mark Setter Neo. Once again, this is fairly inert, so as expected, no reaction. And there was a similar result with Mr. Mark Softer. VMS Decal Set and Fix also had no adverse reaction on the paint surface. VMS Decal Softener performed equally as well. No damage, lift or bubbling. So let's round up the durability tests. This paint is really strong. It's tough and it's also quite scratch resistant. As we found out in the fingernail and toothpick test, the paint also sands extremely well. There's no peel or lift and you'll be able to blend in any finish repairs nicely. And while I didn't extend my test to any oil thinners, it handled setting solutions brilliantly. I'm really impressed with the durability of these paints. They pass this round with flying colors. And for the final test, I wanted to try out the chipping and scratching agent. This came with and was designed for these paints. So let's see how it performs. For the chipping color, I used a mix of black and dark earth. The panels were then given several varying layers of chipping fluid, starting with one for the first panel, two for the second, three for the third, four for the fourth, and five for the fifth. And to save a bit of time, this footage is sped up. The one thing that I immediately liked about this chipping fluid is that the surface tension was good and there was no beading. The only other chipping fluid I've used that's laid down similarly is the VMS one. For the covering coat, I sprayed on a layer of cockpit green. When covering chipping fluid, you don't want to go too heavy or too wet as you might disturb that underlying chipping layer. And once this had dried, I took some slightly warm water and started brushing this over the paint to release that chipping fluid. I'm expecting that the more layers of chipping fluid there are, the easier they will be to release. And as expected, on the panel with five layers of chipping fluid, the paint's already starting to come off. The first panel with one layer, as anticipated, needed a bit more work to get some of that paint to release. So far, the chipping fluid seems to be working really nicely with the paint. As I move through the varying amounts of chipping fluid, the results are to be expected. The more there is, the easier the paint comes off, which is exactly what you want in a chipping fluid. I'll be looking forward to trying this with other brands of paint to see how it performs. It's when we get to the fourth and the fifth layers that some really heavy chipping starts to take place. I'm really pleased that Humbrol has started to branch out to some more advanced weathering techniques. It's nice to see them catch up with some of the other manufacturers and releasing a more varied product base. Cool, those results are really good. I'm pleased with that. And with that test complete, it's time to bring those moody product shots back and do a conclusion. It's awesome to see Humbrol listening to the consumer and making some active changes to their product range. Their previous iteration of these acrylics weren't very popular. And from some of the pots I tried and some of the pots in the starter sets, I can see why. But have Humbrol managed to claw back some of their reputation and bring out a good acrylic paint? I definitely think they have.
As you've probably worked out from the last 20 minutes and 11 seconds of footage, these acrylic paints are a good all-round package. There are some quirks, as you'd expect with any paint, and my biggest problem was getting the paint to flow for fine work. But because of my airbrush setup with my 0.15 needle, I think that's on me. But ultimately on that point, time will tell. If these problems aren't unique to my airbrush, I'd like to think that the new thinner that's in development will help alleviate them. Another point about these paints that impressed me was the brushability. They lay down really smooth and had great self-leveling properties, something brush painters strive for, which is a really nice feature to see. In fact, I have been using some of the paints to detail paint on my next build. One of these things about these Humbrol Gen 2 acrylics that impressed me the most was the durability. They took all the punishment I threw at it like a champ. And that's rare to see. I mean, you start sanding Vallejo and it'll start peeling off, which isn't ideal. So what's my overall verdict? Now, as some of you may know, I'm a little bit of a paint snob. And while I've used water-based acrylics to spray in the past, I've mainly moved over to lacquers. But that being said, I was impressed with how these Humbrol Gen 2 acrylic paints came out. If you see any in the shops, pick up a bottle or two. You'll be nicely surprised. These paints are a far cry from Humbrol's earlier offerings. And that reaction to customer feedback, that's what I like to see in this industry. Anyway, I'm James from LPJ Models, and I hope you found this review useful and informative. I'd like to finish off the video with a huge thanks to my patrons. Thank you guys for supporting my work. I really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank you for watching. I'll see you all in the next one.